Welcome, I'm Bill Brown from Brookings Mountain West. Thanks for joining us tonight for our lecture. I wish I could take credit for scheduling a lecture on overcoming legislative gridlock at the time where we are experiencing the ultimate manifestation, I guess, of, of gridlock with the government shutdown. But I, would, uh, I, I don't want to take any credit for it, nor do I want to take any blame for <laughs> that. The, if you want to blame somebody, you can blame Molly for proposing this topic tonight. <laughs> that sounds fair to me. Uh, but thanks for joining us. It, it will be a timely talk, if nothing else. Uh, in Molly's defense, th this is not a lecture about a government shutdown, but it's about the, the gridlock that we have seen both at the federal and increasingly at the state level in recent years. Uh, but I'm sure in our Q&A we can obviously deal with the shutdown and its relation to gridlock. But we're very pleased to have colleague Molly Jackman out from, from Brookings tonight. Molly's first professional visit to Las Vegas, which she's been in classrooms, I think with some of the people in this room already this week, talking to state legislators about this issue on the state level and uh, meeting with other colleagues as well. Molly's undergraduate work is from UC Berkeley, her grad, Santa, Santa Barbara, I'm sorry. My, my end's at Berkeley, not yours. <laughs> uh, her graduate work at Stanford. Uh, her talk tonight, as we mentioned, is about overcoming gridlock. One of the examples she's gonna use is uh, gun control legislation and, and how that's an example of gridlock. So it's not a lecture about gun control, that's merely a, one of the examples. I'm sure you could have chosen half a dozen others, immigration, uh, the NSA issue, and, and many others. So think, think of the topic not as a topic itself, but as an example of examining gridlock. Uh, as I said, Molly's looking at this issue on the federal level, but she also is doing some interesting work on the state level, looking at state legislators and legislatures. And so I will turn it over to Molly to get us started. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> this is my first trip to Las Vegas ever. So uh, professional or non-professional, and I've been so pleasantly surprised. It's been a great opportunity to meet with students, meet with faculty here, and experience the city, um, and hear more about the politics. As you'll, you're going to see from my work, I study um, procedural rules across all 50 state legislatures. So that's 99 state legislative chambers, and that's that's a that's tricky business. Not to <laughs> pat myself on the back, but there's that's a lot of legislatures to understand, and I get a bird's eye view. I can see what they all look like. I can compare the broad features, but to be on the ground speaking with legislators in your state and understanding the specific dynamics that are going on here has just been an invaluable experience. So thank you for having me. So I wanna um, start by looking at Obama's record on gun control. And Obama hasn't come out, um, well he didn't come out at the beginning of his term saying we need more gun control. But he did say things to that effect. So. In his acceptance speech in 2008, he said, don't tell me we can't uphold the Second Amendment while keeping AK-47s out of the hands of criminals. Then, after the Tucson shooting, he said, that's why our focus right now should be on sound and effective steps that will actually keep those irresponsible, law-breaking few from getting their hands on guns in the first place. So he's getting a little bit more aggressive, not saying you know, we need to change gun laws, but starting to move in that direction. Okay, then we have the shooting in Aurora. And he says, I believe that a lot of gun owners would agree that AK-47s belong in the hands of soldiers, not in the hands of criminals. Reinforcing the same message, we should have an assault weapons ban in place. After the Newton's shooting, in the coming weeks, I'll use whatever power this office holds aimed at preventing more tragedies like this. His statements are becoming stronger and stronger. And then, just recently after the Naval Yard shooting, he said no other advanced nation endures this kind of violence, none. And there is nothing inevitable about it. It comes about because of decisions we make or fail to make, and it falls upon us to make it different. So now he starts talking about actual policy change, pretty explicitly. How does the public feel about gun control? Well, this is a Gallup poll, and um, the lower numbers represent um, public opinion after the shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary School. And what you see is that while most of the public doesn't 
want really, really staunch gun restrictions. They do want more tight gun control. So 91% after Sandy Hook would vote in favor of a requ requiring background checks for gun purchases. 60% um, wanted to reinstate the assault weapons ban. And 54% wanted to limit the sale of ammunition magazines to those with 10 rounds or less. So Obama's kind of on trend with public opinion. Um, this was, these numbers were not as high as you can see um, prior to Sandy Hook, but as more and more of these tragedies took place, the tides of public opinion really started to turn. So the question is, what have we done about it? And change, as you all know, has to originate in Congress. So in the 113th Congress, this current congressional session, there have been 72 bills introduced that pertain to gun control, um, 56 to restrict gun rights and 16 to expand uh, gun rights. Zero of those bills have become law so far. In this session, eight of the 72 bills were reported from committee. So th there was this huge percentage that, um, that were stuck in committee, that never survived the committee process. Um, and one received a floor vote. So we're seeing 71 bills that were introduced to reform gun rights um, that never even come to a floor for the vote, that the majority of the chamber can't even express an opinion on. Of course, the 113th session isn't over yet, and there's still an opportunity for change, but looking to previous sessions, we see very little cause to think that there will be any. So in the 112th Congress, 28 bills, fewer because the gun control was a less salient issue then, were introduced to restrict gun rights. Four of them made it out of committee, four received a floor vote, three passed the chamber where they were introduced, all of which were introduced in the House, and then zero made it out of committee in the Senate. 26 bills were introduced to expand gun rights, and again, zero of those bills made it out of committee. So even though public opinion, the president, there is expressing a preference for greater gun control, Congress isn't able to act. This pattern transcends the issue of gun control. So this graph shows from the 80th to the 108th Congress, and it, the bottom line, <coughs> or sorry, the top line is those bills that were reported out of committee, the bottom line is bills that became public law. And a couple things are of note here. First, let's just look at the recent years. Fewer than 10% of bills that are introduced in the chamber are surviving the committee process. So this always reminds me of the song that most of you have probably heard, I'm Just a Bill, where that bill talks about you know, getting stuck in committee. He'll be lucky if he makes it to the floor. That song motivates most of my research. Um, and so we've got less than 10% of the bills being reported out of committee. The other thing that I think is particularly noteworthy of this um, figure is how closely this bottom line, the bill be that become public law, um, approximates the bills that are being reported out of committee in their chamber of origin. So bills are getting blocked at the committee stage and then conditional on being reported, they have a high probability of passage. So that committee's decision is really having such a strong influence on what public laws are being enacted. So the question that I hope will motivate this talk is what causes legislative inaction? Well, we might just think it's the case that bad bills get blocked. Lots of bills get introduced. Not all of them should pass. We wouldn't want all of them to pass. Floor time is limited. We need some mechanism of just killing those bills before they can make it too far. Another possibility is that majority party size is what's driving legislative inaction. So for instance, Reid almost didn't bring the assault weapons ban to the floor in the Senate, um, even though he had the majority, because he knew it would be dead on arrival in the House. And that's simply because he knew that the House had the num the Republicans in the House had the numbers <coughs> to prevent the assault weapons ban from passing. The greater the majority party size, the more defection it can take and still get express its will. There's also the possibility that polarization within and across parties is driving gridlock. And I think this is the one we hear talk, we, what we hear talked about the most. If you look at a graph of preferences in, um, in Congress, they really form this, it's a very bimodal distribution. Um, Democrats are on the left, Republicans are on the right, and there's a big valley separating them. So we have very tight preferences within parties, very extreme heterogeneity across the party's preferences. So the two parties 
don't agree. Um, so how does intraparty heterogeneity cause legislative inaction? Well, we're not seeing a lot of that right now because there's a lot of within party homogeneity. But 15 red state Democratic sen senators voted against the assault weapons ban because they're from red states, their they're seats are not safe, and they needed to. Um, on the flip side, we have the highest unity level of party unity in House history. This was uh, a recent Brookings report showed this. Um, and that's causing a lot of the, the conflict in the House. That's causing a lot of the inaction because the Republicans are all voting together and you don't see any votes on bills that the Republicans don't want to see pass. <coughs> so what I'm going to argue is that these factors cannot account for the totality of congressional inaction. In order for them to play a role, you need the procedural rules to facilitate bill blocking. So to go back to this instance of committees, committees wouldn't be powerful at all if they didn't have the right to decline to hear or to report bills to the floor. If all bills that came to committee had to be reported out, committees would not be a veto point in the legislative process. The rules have to be in place to make it that way. So what do procedural rules look like in the US House? As we've seen, and as I just said, Committees can block bills. They can decline to hear them or to report them. And that allows for that, um, that less than 10% percentage percent report rate from committees that we saw in the figure earlier. In addition, the Speaker and the Rules Committee have a lot of discretion to determine the order of bills on the floor calendar. For instance, the Rules Committee can propose special orders, which would move bills up on the calendar. And it's implicitly move other bills off the calendar entirely because of limited floor time. So I want to take a second to define a couple terms that I'm going to use throughout the talk today. Um, and the first is majority party gatekeeping rights. So the majority party has a gatekeeping right if the procedures allow it to not act on a particular proposal and in this inaction results in the status quo policy remaining in place. So this is for instance um, the majority party's ability to decide not to hear bills in committee or the majority of um, a party leader's ability to set the floor agenda. This majority party gatekeeping rights are subtly distinct from majority party gatekeeping power. So the majority party has gatekeeping power if it holds a gatekeeping right, and as a result of that right, it gets an outcome that it prefers relative to the one that would in the absence of the right. So it's one thing to say that they can exercise a right and maintain a status quo. It's another thing to say that the maintaining that status quo makes them better off. So this is a subtle distinction, but one that I want you to keep in mind as we go forward. The question I ask is, do majority party gatekeeping rights lead to increased majority party power? So does this gatekeeping right, the ability to block bills in committees, the ability to block bills at the calendar stage, result in outcomes that the majority party likes? The, the problem with this, and most of the literature on the US Congress um, fails to address this, is we have to determine whether or not majority party gatekeeping rights, these procedural rules that exist, are facilitating majority party power above and beyond these other factors that I mentioned, like the size and heterogeneity of parties in the legislature. The factors that we more con um, conventionally think of as connected to gridlock. So ideally, we'd like to have some baseline model to, effect, to assess the effect of procedural rules. So one example of a baseline model would be what are procedural, what, if, what does majority party power look like in the absence of any majority party gatekeeping rights? Does the majority party still have power because of its size or because of the homogeneity of its members' preferences? Well, unfortunately, we can't do that in the House because majority party gatekeeping rights are unconditionally present there. So we have no way of evaluating what majority party power would look like in the absence of those rules. Alternatively, we could look at how variation in majority party gatekeeping rights explains variation in majority party power and legislative outcomes. But we can't do that again in the House because, well, one, there isn't a lot of variation. Um, rules have been mostly the same for a long, long time. And when we did see rules changing in the 19th century in the US House, they changed very infrequently and they changed simultaneously. So it wasn't that one rule got changed and that we could assess that particular rule's effect on legislative outcomes. They all changed at the same time, so it's hard to identify the particular procedural mechanisms that led to majority party power. So rather than deal with looking at the US House where there's not a lot of variation, I look at the states where there is a tremendous amount of variation. 
So there's tons of variation in legislative outcomes, for one. So going back to the example of gun control, in the 2011-2012 legislative session, over 1,000 bills were introduced that had to do with gun laws in the US states. There were 284 to strengthen gun rights, 425 to strengthen gun control, and a whole lot of others that were neutral, things like having a national gun day or um, having a state gun of Texas. Um, of those, 148 bills passed. So here we are actually seeing variation. We're seeing some bills pass. Um, and as you're going to see later, we are seeing different levels of um, progression through the legislative process with these bills. We're seeing a lot of bills to strengthen gun control. We're seeing a lot of bills to weaken it. This is a better laboratory for testing. The other thing about the US states that's advantageous for me is that there's also a ton of variation in procedural rules and majority party gatekeeping rights. Now there's a question there because I'm, I'm gonna try to convince you that that variation exists. And um, to my knowledge, I'm the first, uh, me and my co-author Sarah Anzia, we were the first people to really say what do, the, what do procedural rules look like in the US states and to collect that data. Um, so this is new data. Um, that hasn't really been examined before. Okay, so because this is unprecedented, measuring procedural rules in the states, and because it really would be a tremendous, near impossible task to measure all of the procedural rules in all of the state chambers, um, we tried to narrow it down to two junctures in the legislative process that the majority party could potentially exercise gatekeeping rights at. And we thought about the committee stage and the calendar stage. And if you think back to I'm just a bill, the bill does too. Um, so these are the two main junctures at which the majority party typically blocks legislation. Um, the National Conference of State Legislatures fortunately offered some survey data um, from state clerks and secretaries that helped us um, to measure committee procedures. Um, for the rest, we were kind of on our own. So what we did was we went out and we surveyed the state legislative clerks and secretaries in all 99 state legislative ch chambers. We asked them how bills were placed on the flo chamber floor's calendar, who appoints committee members and chairs, and whether the full chamber votes on committee appointments. And we see received about 91 responses. So let's take a look at what the distribution of procedural rules in the states actually looks like. So to start with the committee, um, to committee gatekeeping rights, the first veto point in the legislative process. The first question is, can a majority party appointed committee decline to hear bills? So let's break this down. A majority appointed committee, according to our definition, is one that is appointed by the majority party. And this is the case in all but four chambers, where seniority ex is the exclusive determina um, determining factor in what members are appointed to committees. In all others, the majority party has wide discretion to appoint at least its members to committee. Um, the ability to decline to hear bills, well, if you don't have to hear a bill, you don't have to, for that bill doesn't have to make it through the committee stage. So it does serve as a blocking point. And the answer to this question is yes in 72 chambers. Second, we considered whether a majority appo party appointed committee can decline to report get bills, which again would make committees a veto point in the legislative process. That's true in 74 chambers. So can a majority party appointed committee either decline to hear or to report bills? Because either one, it should be sufficient for the majority party to block bills from continuing further in the legislative process. The answer is yes, in 79 state legislative chambers. Okay, so that's a lot. And we might say that in most chambers, um, the majority party can block bills in committee, and we would be correct in saying so. However, I want to point out that there are 20 state legislative chambers in which the majority party does not block bills in committee. That means that every bill introduced in committee has to emerge from it. Um, this is a surprising idea to a lot of people um, who grew up on I'm just a bill, saying I'm gonna get stuck in committee, I'll be really lucky if I survive. But there are 20 state chambers in the United States where that is not the case. Next, moving on to calendar gatekeeping rights, the second juncture at which bills can be blocked. So the first question we asked is, can a majority leader set the floor calendar? And the answer is yes in 45 chambers. There's a lot of cases in which majority appointed committees can set the calendar. Specifically, there are 16. And then there are 61 chambers in which either a majority leader or a majority appointed committee can set the floor calendar. Um, in the remaining chambers, the calendar order is determined by some automatic process. For instance, numerical order of bills or <laughs> alphabetical order of bills. 
are there any questions about the coding scheme before I move on, or questions more generally? Okay. Feel free to interrupt me if you do have questions. Um, I put together um, some slides with information on how the, your clerk and secretary in Nevada responded to these questions, uh, and I'm happy to circle back around to those during the Q&A, but I want to move forward to make sure we have time to get through everything. But um, I'll give you the big takeaway, which is the majority party has committee gatekeeping rights, but not calendar gatekeeping rights in both chambers in Nevada. Okay. So we have our measure of majority party gatekeeping rights. We know whether or not in each chamber the majority party can block bills at the committee or the calendar stages. But it's still an open question whether or not those gatekeeping rights lead to majority party power, the majority party's ability to not only block bills it dislikes, but to get outcomes it prefers. This is, a harder th this is a hard thing to measure. Um, and it's especially hard to measure across all of the states where we don't know what the majority party might want and we want a common measure that captures majority party preferences in each of these 99 chambers. So we think if a majority party has gatekeeping rights, no bill should come to the floor that the leadership opposes. Pretty basic. So the next question is what bills would the majority party in any type of legislature oppose? The answer to this is majority rules. And if you have other suggestions for different measures of, or different ideas about what bills the majority party might oppose, I would love to hear them because this is certainly an imperfect measure. But I think it's one that can be generalized across all legislatures. So a majority rule is a passing, bill, a passing bill on which a majority of the majority party voted in opposition. So this is a bill that passes against the wishes of the majority of the majority party. Um, the prediction then, because the majority party is with gatekeeping rights is going to block bills it doesn't like, which are going to be majority roles, is that if the majority party has gatekeeping rights, majority role rates should be zero or at least allowing for a little bit of error, very, very low. So here's an example, immigration reform, something that um, we've uh, very, has been on the minds of a lot of people very recently. Um, immigration reform, the comprehensive immigration bill that the Senate passed is now stuck in committee in the House. And um, the reason that Boehner said um, it should be stuck in committee is he invoked the, an informal procedure um, called the Haster Rule. Um, he's quoted as saying, I don't see any way of bringing an immigration reform bill to the floor that doesn't have the support of a majority of Republicans. So in other words, he's not going to allow comprehensive immigration reform to come to the floor because he thinks, well, I'll infer what he thinks. He thinks that if it did, that bill would pass. There would be enough moderate Republicans or Republicans with interest in seeing an immigration bill pass um, that would vote in favor of the bill, but it would pass against the wishes of the majority of the party the Tea Partiers, the more extreme members, who don't want immigration reform to pass. So in other words, it would be a majority role. I'm sorry that this is so um, difficult to read. This is scanned out of a book. Um, this is from Cox and McCubbin setting the agenda, and this tracks um, majority role rates in the US House and Senate. And you can see the set, well, look, just focus on this part of the graph, um, the uh, majority role rates in the US House and the more recent era. And what you see is that they are low, sometimes they're zero, mostly they're beneath 5%. The majority party in the U.S. House has gatekeeping rights, that's what we expect them to be. What do majority role rates look like in the U.S. state legislatures? Well, when I look at this, the first thing I think is that they're certainly not zero. There are some state legislative chambers in which they are zero, there's eight of them. But then there's a whole bunch in which the majority is rolled on a lot of votes. Um, so in most, majority roll rates are below 5%, which we might consider low enough to conform to our conventional views of legislatures. But then there are all of these state chambers where the majority is rolled on more than 10% of votes, and there are all these chambers in which it's rolled on more than 15% of votes. Now if I showed you what minority roll rates look like in the US House, they'd be up here. So majority roll rates are not universally low in the U.S. states. Nevada House, just uh, for your information, this is data from 1999 and 2000. Um, in that session, 138 
um, bills came to a vote in the House, or in the Assembly, I'm sorry, that's a typo, or uh, yes, that's incorrect. Um, there were three majority rolls, which meant the majority roll rate was 2.3%. In the Senate, the majority roll rate was 0.8%. Um, so what I did in um, my research is to assess the effect of these gatekeeping rights at the committee stage and the calendar stage on majority roll rates. And we can begin at the committee stage. So the presence of non-hearing rights, um, so the ability to not hear a bill in committee, leads to a 2.3 percentage point decrease in majority roll rates. Non-reporting rights lead to a 2.1 percentage point decrease in majority roll rates. And having either non-hearing or non-reporting rights leads to a um, 2.3 percentage point decrease in majority roll rates. So this is consistent with the idea that majority roll rates are lower in chambers where the majority party has the right to block bills at the committee stage. Moving now to cal the calendar stage. So in chambers where the majority party um, leader can determine the order of bills on the floor calendar, and I'm sorry for the typo in this slide as well, this should be 6.1%. I got a little too excited about the zero there. Um, so the, the effect of having a majority leader that sets the floor calendar is nothing. That rule doesn't matter. The effect of having a majority appointed committee, so this would be a rules committee or a calendar committee, um, set the order of bills on the floor calendar is 2.2 percentage points. And then the total effect of having either a majority leader or a majority appointed committee set the floor calendar is 1.4 percentage points. The takeaway again, majority roll rates are lower in chambers where the majority party can block bills at the calendar stage. Now, rules don't exist in isolation. Most chambers have both committee and calendar gatekeeping rights. In fact, all chambers have both committee and calendar gatekeeping rules. So it's not so helpful to consider them in isolation. It's more helpful to consider how these rules interact to, um, to increase or decrease majority party power. So the first thing is what do majority roll rates look like in that perfect baseline mat um, model in which neither committee nor calendar gatekeeping rights exist? That's the model, remember, we want it at the beginning of the discussion. And we can evaluate that in the states. And majority roll rates are 8.4%. So that's, that's pretty high. That's um, significantly higher than most scholars who study the US House would predict roll rates should be, um, which shows that procedural rules are having some effect there. Um, if committee gatekeeping rights exist in the absence of, gate, of calendar gatekeeping rights, majority roll rates decrease relative to that baseline by about two percentage points. If calendar gatekeeping rights exist in the absence of committee, again, I'm sorry, typo, of committee gatekeeping rights, we see about a one percentage point decrease in majority roll rates. So from this and the previous slide, we might conclude that committee gatekeeping rights have a much stronger effect on majority party power and influence relative to calendar gatekeeping rights. And that's true to a certain degree. And it makes sense, right? If you can block bills in committee, you don't really need to block bills at the calendar stage. Um, you've already done it. So the calendar stage is relatively unimportant. Um, the problem with this is that in practice, people make errors. And the composition of committees might vary. And the majority party might not always get what it wants on the first try. So we do see a cumulative effect of committee and calendar gatekeeping rights that's greater than committee gatekeeping rights alone. So chambers that have both committee and calendar gatekeeping rights have an average majority roll rate of 5.3%. And that's starting to get back in the range where we might think of majority roll rates as being low. So the conclusion from this is that majority, low ro sorry, majority roll rates are lower in chambers where the majority party exercises gatekeeping rights, consistent with the hypothesis. Um, I want to look at the case of Colorado, and I want to do this for two reasons. Um, the first is that there's, there's been a lot of work on how majority party influence affects gridlock, on how procedural rules allow the majority party to set the agenda. Um, however, this work, I think, contributes to the study of institutional design beyond the study of majority party power. So if you all you students, you've probably read a lot of these theories, and if you were asked to design an, a rule book for a legislature from the ground up, you were told there's this, this new state in the union, what rules should we put in place to privilege the majority party? I read a lot of this literature, I would have no idea. Um, 
And the problem is that most of it focuses on the US House, so we can't assess the effect of a particular rule on majority party power, or on minority party power, for that matter. Um, and by looking, by leveraging the variation that exists across the states, we can start to say which rules matter, which rules don't, which rules matter more than others. The second reason I want to look at the Colorado House is because it's super cool. So in 1989, Colorado passed an initiative that took away majority party gatekeeping rights. So it abolished majority party gatekeeping rights at the committee and the calendar stages of the legislative process. Which means that in Colorado, if a bill gets introduced, it has to be reported out of committee and it has to make it to a floor vote. So this is a really interesting case. And in Colorado, the majority roll rate is 9.7% high, significantly higher than average by about one standard deviation. Now we can start to consider, well, what if they, what if they change their rules? And we can look at how particular rules did, may, would, affect, um, this change, would affect the roll rate. For instance, what happens if we add a non-hearing right? What happens if we um, impose a seniority requirement for committee appointments? But I want to look at them more generally since we have limited time. So if Colorado, the Colorado House, were to adopt a committee gatekeeping right, were to allow majority appointed committees to decline to hear or to report bills, we would expect to see a 2.7 percentage point decrease in the majority roll rate, bringing it down to 7%. If they were to adopt a calendar gatekeeping right in the absence of a committee gatekeeping right, we would have, there would be no effect on the roll rate at all. It would stay up right around 9.7%. But if they were to adopt both committee and calendar gatekeeping rights, we would see a 5.2 percentage point decrease in majority roll rates, bringing that roll rate down to 4.5%, which is something I would describe as low. I'm kind of using this 5% as a threshold for a roll rate that I would define as sufficiently low to confirm to our expectations. I mentioned before that there are these confounding influences. A majority party size might also affect roll rates, and in fact, it, it strongly, strongly does. The relationship between majority party size and majority roll rates is 18%. So majority party size alone explains 18% of the variation in majority roll rates. Um, and the other advantage to doing research on the states where there is all of this variation in the size of parties and the heterogeneity of their rules and preferences is that we can compare the effect of majority party size. We can say, how, how would adding X many members affect um, the majority party's power relative to adding this particular procedural rule? So to give you an example of how we can do that, a one standard deviation increase in the size of the majority party in Colorado, um, which would be 9.5 percentage points, non-trivial, would result in a 3.1 percentage point decrease in majority rolls. So to get that same effect, that's 5.2 percentage point decrease in majority roll rates, the same as um, instituting both committee and calendar gatekeeping rights, we would need to see the majority party size increase by 16 that's huge. So why should we care about this? Um, it's hard to get too excited about procedural rules. I recognize that. Um, however, I think it is significant that we consider these things. Um, the first is that procedural rules affect gridlock. They affect policy outcomes, and we don't think about them enough. So 5.2 percentage points is equivalent in the average chamber to about 23 bills. And these aren't just the normal bills, um, the votes on commendations, the votes on amendments, the, the ones that we don't really care about. These are the important bills. These are the bills that are coming to the floor and passing against the wishes of the speaker. They're passing against what the majority party wants. These are the bills like gun control, like immigration reform, like the NSA, like the continuing resolution that's being held up in the committee in the House right now that really shape policy in our country. So 5.2 percentage points, while it might not look like a big deal on paper, it's a big deal in practice. I want to go back to our example of gun control to illustrate how this actually might work for a particular policy. So, okay, this doesn't get at that exact point, but I think it's a good starting point. 31.9 percent of bills introduced on the topic of gun control emerge out of committee, out of the committee um, in the chamber in which that bill was introduced. 25.5% receive a chamber vote in their committee of origin. 24.4 pass in that chamber. 18.5, so this is the next big, big veto point, um, 
18.5 make it out of committee in the second chamber because we have bicameral legislatures. 18.1 will come to a vote in that second chamber. 17.3 pass that chamber. 14.7 become public law. So what you might expect is big drops here. Big drops once you pass these procedural hurdles um, and have to actually get a chamber vote. A lot of bills failing. What you're actually seeing is that the percentage of bills passing um, passing the chamber is not really that different from the percentage of bills that are being reported out of committee. That's, that's the big veto point. That's where laws are getting made. We can consider this a little bit more explicitly too. So I, um, I separated chambers into those that have committee gatekeeping rights and those that don't. And what we find is that in chambers that don't um, have committee gatekeeping rights, where committees can't block bills, we see this huge increase in the number of bills that are reported from committee on the issue of gun control. It trickles down. So we see about, um, so we see 38.6% of bills rather than 24.7% of bills coming to a floor vote if there are no committee gatekeeping rights. We see a big jump in the percentage of bills that pass the chamber, and then we see a big jump in the percentage of bills that are becoming public law. So again, here's a real policy, here are real bills. We're seeing how having committee gatekeeping rights as opposed to not having committee gatekeeping rights makes a big difference. Now moving on to the calendar stage. The effects are still big, uh, not as big. But we're seeing in chambers with no calendar gatekeeping rights, so where a majority party leader or a majority appointed committee does not set the floor calendar, <coughs> we're seeing um, about 46.9% of bills that were on the topic of gun control coming out of committee as compared to 27.3% um, that are getting held up. So one of the reasons for this is that committees might be conditioning their action based on what they know is going to happen at the calendar stage. We see 42.7 as opposed to 20.2% coming to a final passage vote in their chamber of origin. We see 41.2% as compared to 20%, so more than double the percentage of bills passing their chamber of origin, and almost triple the number becoming public law in chambers that do not allow the majority of the party to block bills at the calendar stage of the legislative process. So lastly, we can consider chambers that have both calendar and committee gatekeeping rights, and the effects are huge here. So we see almost double the number of bills um, getting a committee report in chambers where these neither of these rights exist, um, more than double receiving a final passage vote, um, more than double passing their chamber of origin, and 18.2% rather than 14.7% becoming public law. So to me, this is pretty compelling evidence that these rules are not just affecting majority roll rates, this particular outcome that only occurs in the chamber of origin. These are having real effects on policies like gun control. The second reason which of why we should care is something I've already talked about, institutional design. Um, legislatures vote on their procedural rules at the beginning of every session. Um, this is the case in almost every legislature in the world. Um, and it doesn't, it requires a 50% vote. It means that this moderate member who's right in the middle of the preferences of the chamber is really getting to determine which rules are going to govern the body for that session. Um, we don't know what rules matter. <laughs> they don't know what rules matter. But I think that this can tell us which rules do matter, which rules we shouldn't care about, which rules legislatures might, might benefit from adopting, and which rules they might benefit from abolishing, based on how they want the distribution of power to look like. So to conclude, partisan polarization, as you all know, as is very apparent today, is preventing important policy making in the United States. The majority party exercises power in legislatures not only by pushing bills forward in the legislative process, but also by holding bills back, by blocking them. This is um, what's referred to as the second face of power. And in order to, for this to be the case, the majority party doesn't only need a size advantage. It doesn't only need polarization, but it needs to have rights. It needs to have the rules in place that allow the preferences of its members to manifest, to allow those members to block bills. And the majority party shares um, a greater policy advantage where it can block bills in committee and it can block bills from appearing on the floor calendar.
So with that, I will open things up for questions. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Let me apologize first. I forgot to mention that <coughs> uh, for those of you who are taking notes or want to refer to Molly's PowerPoint, it's uh, already up on our Brookings Mountain West website. So if you go there tonight or tomorrow under past lectures, you'll see a link to the PowerPoint. So if you want to make reference to any of the graphs or charts or information, they're there, as will the video of this lecture in a few days. So my apologies to those of you who might have been scribbling frantically while Molly was talking. Uh, anybody want to start us off with a question right here? Uh, yeah, that would be very interesting talk there. H have you, uh, I guess most, certainly the House of Representatives, most legislatures, I guess, require the appropriation side, appropriations to begin in, in the House. Have, have you noticed any difference with those types of bills? And do houses in general have more blocking than Senates, or have you been able to notice any distinction? Um, so, unfortunately, I haven't been able to look at appropriations bills more specifically. It's something I have this, I would really love to do. Unfortunately, it's very hard to get information on um, appropriations bills at the state levels. Um, with regard to Houses versus Senates, um, Senates are uh, traditionally thought of as being more collegial, um, more more effective governing bodies. Uh, well, not more effective, less impulsive. Whether or not that's true is open to debate. But what I can say is that Senates do have lower rates of majority roles on average than do Houses. Yeah, so I recently wrote a paper on um, immigration reform, and I touched on this a little bit um, during the talk, um, and how procedural rules are being exploited, formal and informal, in order to keep that bill in committee. Um, and the Hastert rule was invoked, but the reason that the Hastert rule can be invoked is that there are procedural rules, formal rules, in place that allow the majority party to prevent a bill from coming to the floor. So the one that's being exercised is the committee's gatekeeping rights. Committees don't have to report the committee doesn't have to report the Senate version of its comprehensive immigration reform to the floor. So, and that's on the instruction of Speaker Boehner, I imagine. Um, right now, the continuing resolution, that the clean continuing resolution from the Senate is stuck in House committee. Um, so we definitely do, do see these procedural rules um, having a big effect on what bills are getting passed in the US House, um, having a big impact, it's just that in my mind, unfortunately, people don't talk about the procedural rules, they talk about the polarization. Mm -hmm. Sir? Uh, for, in, in a state like Colorado, where they, have, they don't have either the gatekeeping or the calendar, uh, what's to prevent a party who wants to create get gridlock from just introducing frivolous bill after frivolous bill into the, into, into causing constant floor votes? Not a lot. So the, the problem with getting rid of all of your procedural rules is that you don't allow those bad bills to get blocked. Um, and um, I think the main thing that's, get, that's preventing that from having such a big impact is that there is limited time in a session. So um, one thing that's, that confu is confusing about one of the, uh, let me go back here. Okay, so here. These are chambers that have no committee gatekeeping rights. So what that means is that um, every bill re introduced has to get a committee report. Why isn't that 100%? The answer is that committees don't have time. Um, they have to prioritize, and if the session ends before all bills are considered in committee, then the session ends. Um, so I think while those rules do make it more likely that frivolous legislation is going to um, create more gridlock on the floor um, because you can just introduce whatever you want and it has a, it has a higher probability of making it to a floor vote, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that that's going to be entirely the case in practice. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, please. 
um, committee chairmen, are they mostly dictatorial speakers? Do they set the calendar without uh, much, or are they pretty much on their own in setting the, the calendar? Um, in other words, was there any diversity between, say, one state and another state in terms of how a speaker could perhaps dict dictate what the calendar would be? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there were 45 states, uh, state chambers in which the presiding officer, which most of the time was the speaker or the president in the Senate, sometimes the majority leader, um, would set the floor calendar. And by that I mean could determine kind of on the fly the order of bills on the calendar. Um, there were a lot of states in which the calendar, in contrast, would be set by an automatic process, so numerical order or alphabetical order. Um, so there's certainly states in which um, majority leaders do have more control over the floor calendar. Do, do state legislatures have the power in some places to blast bills out of committee that uh, they can't get otherwise? They do. Um, yeah, in most state legislatures there is some sort of committee discharge procedure and um, I found in, a, in another paper that's going to be published hopefully very soon that, um, and actually a paper published on the Brookings website, that um, the presence of some sort of committee discharge procedure, um, even in chambers with committee gatekeeping rights, leads to an increase in majority role rates. So even though committee discharge isn't something that occurs frequently, just by being on the books and being a credible threat against majority party obstructionism, it does lead the majority party to condition its behavior. So right now, my current, the current project I'm working on is on minority rights, and I've, um, I'm doing two surveys. The first is of state legislative clerks and secretaries, similar to this, asking them if what, what mechanisms does the minority party have at its disposal to stall legislation. Um, the second one is a survey of minority leaders and whips in the 99 chambers, asking them um, what mechanisms they think they, they're more inclined to use, which mechanisms they can use and which ones they think are most effective in allowing them to stall legislation. And um, the filibuster gets a lot of attention. I, I always go back to the definition of a filibuster, which is um, any procedure that allows <coughs> for the stalling of, for inaction, for allows um, a group to stall a vote. Um, so the mechanism in the, in the Senate is obviously prolonged debate. I'm not convinced that if we got rid of that rule that there would be less filibustering. Um, so in a lot of states, as we've seen, um, uh, withholding a quorum is another way to filibuster for the minority party. Um, in other places, it can be by introducing lots of dilatory motions to stall a vote or lots of um, non-germane amendments, anything that would slow the process down. So while prolonged debate does get a lot of attention because of its use in the Senate, it's certainly not the only way to slow legislation. Could I ask one obvious question? And that, Absolutely. That is in studying all these states, you've taken a look at Nevada. Yeah. Is there, are, are we in the norms on this, or do, are there things where we stand out? So um, before I came here, I pulled up my data, and I looked at Nevada, and I thought, looks right. <laughs> um, the majority roll rate is low. Um, you have procedural institutions in place that allow the majority party to block bills. Well, then I get here, and um, I learn about what's going on here. And the interesting thing about Nevada to me is when I, when I studied uh, these, these dynamics, I think about a one-dimensional policy space, a left-to-right policy spectrum. What you have here is a, is a two-dimensional policy space, if not three. You have um, left-to-right, particularly on social issues, it seems, and then you also have a geographical dimension. So that allows for really interesting coalitions to form in the legislature um, that are across party lines. Um, and I'm really interested in studying Nevada in the future because this is such an interesting dynamic that I don't see happening elsewhere. Please. I'm curious about those cases where there, uh, where there are no gatekeeping functions for the majority party. Yeah. Uh, one, it seems like serving on a committee would be almost almost useless unless you really want to mold the content of, the, of certain bills. Uh, but also, can the majority party and the, or the majority party 
committee to just start rewriting bills that they don't that uh, they don't like or amending bills that they don't like to make sure that on the floor votes they lose. And they can, yeah. And again, a huge power that committees have is to determine the order in which they hear bills. So limited floor time, you get a bunch of bills in front of you, you're going to prioritize. And even though you might not have the explicit right to say, okay, we're not gonna take a vote on that bill, I don't wanna talk about it, you can still say, let's consider it later. And if the session runs out, that bill is dead. So, um, so while committee gatekeeping rights are important, and I, I'm pretty convinced of that, um, there it doesn't mean that committees don't have other ways of influencing legislation. I, just one last question I'd like to pop on. Uh, so have you seen differences? There are a few states, and Nevada would be one that's a citizen legislature, yeah, and that meets for a, a finite time. Uh, is, is that a strong determining factor? I find that controlling for the level of legislative professionalism doesn't affect um, how procedural rules, rules affect um, majority party power. However, I do find that um, if you consider only citizen legislatures, these rules have a much weaker effect um, on majority party power. And I think one of the reasons is that if you have a 120 day session, everything's getting ironed out ahead of time. Um, you're not using the rules as strategically while the session is going on um, necessarily. Um, and a lot of it's bipartisan. These people, they have other jobs. Um, they are busy throughout the years. They're not sitting around thinking, how can I gain the system? Um, it's more about, we have a list of things we need to get done. Let's get them done expediently. So there, there isn't as much um, strategic work going on. Anyone with a last question? Please. Uh, I wanted to know, how is, how is this affected by a smaller uh, emerging parties that, although may not reach the majority, are uh, actually influential, such as the Tea Party, who has not reached the majority, obviously, but has changed the game where it's not just strictly Republican versus Democrat. And this yeah. is statewide versus, you know. So um, the Tea Party is caucusing with the Republicans. And I think, I think the answer is something that I haven't talked about a lot, which is heterogeneity within parties. And you would think that more heterogeneity within the party would weaken majority party influence. Um, so rather than thinking about it as an emerging third party, which we really just don't see a lot of in the United States, think about it as um, adding new heterogeneity within the Republican party, which should weaken the majority party. Last chance, last call? We don't have I last call. I think there was someone in the <laughs> back of the room? Or? No. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Molly will be around if you have <laughs> questions you want to follow up on. And hope to see you next week. <laughs>